I'm going to start recording and say hello officially. We're talking about homework. Uh, just for those of you who are listening on Zoom, you should be able to hear me better because I have the lap laptop microphone on, but that means you're not going to hear the people talking in the room very well. So I'm going to try to remember to repeat the questions or the comments so that the recording and the Zoomers can uh, make sure they get catch everything. Okay, so we have, we're have we talking about M plus strategy and usage. Go. So, like, if you have a big data set that you're working with with lots of variables, yes. are you probably better off, like, adapting it Yes, so the question is, if you have a large data set with a million variables, should you cut that data set down to just what you need before putting it into M+, plus? and absolutely, is that's the way I would do it. Because, yeah, otherwise you have to list everything and ensure that they're all in the right order. Like, that process can be unnecessarily tedious. So, yeah, I usually just subset into just the columns. Um, another thing is that you can't have string variables in M+. Plus. It will throw up on you. So any columns that have words, you can't have. Yep. At least I've always had error messages instead of output when I've tried. So that's my interpretation. You cannot do it, at least, because I could not make it work. Yeah, the error messages are... Not like helpful? You said, it takes some getting used to. Uh -huh. I was like... What? Uh, yeah. Is that what you <laughs> Yeah, the first error message you are likely to see is if you forget to delete the names of your variables from the first row of your data set. I do that at least once a week. Um, and, it, and the error message has something like unknown character in column one, whatever. It's, it's because it's looking at words and it's waiting for a number. So if you, if you forget to delete the top row, you'll get an error for that. But I have, um, so does that all, answer all your questions for now? Yeah. Okay, cool. So I wanted to remind folks that in homework two, which is what we've started talking about here, you're getting a chance to practice uh, classical test theory stuff and CFA stuff. In section two, I think it is, I asked, to, asked you to run a model where it says type equals basic. Inside this example file where I had done a demonstration on how to actually use the software, one of the models in this set of examples is that type where it's type equals basic. So it just prints spits out descriptive statistics. So you can look in that place for an example of that. Alternatively, you could actually fit the saturated model and get the same thing. So the, the distinction is, and let me actually pull it, up, pull it up here for real quick. One second. Oh, that's very large. Yes, yes. There we go. So in section two, so for instance, one of the questions is asking you to find where in the output the variance of one of the items is, and I have in bold, as estimated by ML. So if you were to print what the variance is using R or any other package where you're using descriptive statistics, you will not get the right answer because that version of variance divides by N minus one, whereas the ML solution divides by N. And so you can actually like algebraically solve for what it should be, but that defeats the purpose. I'm trying to get folks used to using M plus and finding things in there. So you can either do type equals basic um, to answer this section, or you can just fit the saturated model. And I verified that those, those both work equivalently in this case. So, all right. Any other homework questions since I'm on the page here? Zoomers? I'll take that as a no. Everyone's all quiet today. And Vladimir is in the Zoom room, folks. So if you want to send any questions or suggestions to him, you can do that. So I have then, we're wrapping up CFA today. That's my plan. Like for real. <laughs> I think this is like video part 11 or something of this, this lecture series. But that's my plan. And next week we get to start IRT. So anyone who is in the IRT class, come on in. We'll all talk about IRT. We'll all have a great time. And I'm, I'm building a new example of a construct map this weekend with my son. So stay tuned for that. He's going to help me. You'll see what it is. The, the previous one that I had in the slide deck was a, a reference to 80s pop culture as the construct. And then I had examples of like low items and medium items and high items. When I built that example in 2007, it killed 
<laughs> but now, like, you know, 15 years later or whatever, most of my students were not alive in the 80s. It's, it's not a useful example anymore. So I'm, I'm changing it up. And Lord knows I can't do like the aughts pop culture because I'm too old to know anything that's happening currently. So, but this one will, will, will be a, a trip, trip down memory lane for some of you and relevant to others. So that's what we're going to do next week, assuming we get everything done. But we have the remainder of example four to go through. And there are models at the end that you will need to complete your homework. So we got to make sure that we get through that before we can start anything else. So I thought it would be good to pick up on example four, page eight, and look through the solution for the single factor model again. Talk about um, degrees of freedom. We talked about that a little bit. We can go back over that and how to judge global and local fit. So that sound good? Yeah. All right. Away we go. I'm watching the chat, Zoomers, if you want to talk to me. Can you all hear me and see me okay? Excellent. Thank you. So the first thing it tells you at the top of the output after it gives you a whole bunch of crap that you don't need, <laughs> I should clarify, the, uh, in any of these output files, I'll open one of them here, for instance. This is what M plus output looks like. It spits back all of your syntax at the top, which is convenient. So if you ever need to send me something, you only need to send me the output because everything you told it is at the top of the file. And then it tells you about your sample size, what kind of variables you have and how many. It tells you about what estimation and other types of uh, convergence uh, options you've asked for, what the defaults are. Then we get into how much missing data you have. We get into descriptive statistics and then finally, you should see this as the happy message, the model estimation terminated normally. That means your model is not broken, you may proceed. Anything other than that phrase is a problem. So this is where the output actually starts about um, maybe two fifths of the way through the file. So I have truncated just to the parts that we need. So 18 is the number of estimated parameters, what it calls free parameters. I have six items in this example. Here's the formula that we reviewed the other day, number of variables or items, outcomes, V times V plus one divided by two plus V. So this part here gives you the number of variances and covariances in your data. And then the plus V adds the number of means. So in terms of degrees of freedom, that's the total. Like that's the maximum number of parameters that you could possibly estimate with these data. It's based on the total number of item variances, covariances, and means. So if I have uh, six items in this, we'll do the math here. Oh, no. Let's see. Six times seven. It's 42 divided by two is 21 plus six more is 27. I did it. I did it. See, and I wrote it out because I literally did not trust myself to get it right in front of you. But I did it. So we're starting with 27. Now, how many do we need to spend to estimate this model. So if we list out all possible types of parameters we could have, as far as we know at this point, we could do factor loadings, we could do intercepts, we could do error variances, and we could do error covariances. So those four together are called the measurement model, those four types of parameters. On the other side, the structural model as it's known, we've got factor quantities. Factor means factor variances, factor covariances. So there's seven types of parameters that we might use. This is a single factor model. Each item has its own loading. Each item has its own intercept. Each item has its own error variance. So we can take a shortcut and say number of items times three is usually a good starting point for what a measurement model is. So in this case, because it's a single factor, it's 18 is the number of parameters. So 27 possible pieces of information from your data, you spent 18 of them on the model, leaves you with nine. So nine represents the total number of parameters you could still add. And once you get to zero, then you're just identified, meaning fit is perfect and you have no room to be wrong. So first value then, HO, log likelihood, that's how tall your data are according to your model. It's an aggregate across your sample. The scale factor goes into the calculations for how to do model comparisons. H1 
is always for the saturated model. So that's what if I just literally asked it to estimate the means, variances, and covariances? That's how tall my data would be. So that's my reference for what is maximally possible. That's the best fitting model I can have. AIC and BIC are in the opposite direction. They are indices of shortness because they start with minus two log likelihood as their base. And they adjust for penalty functions as a function of the complexity of the model, number of parameters. So these can be useful for non-nested model comparisons if you ever have any of those. Then we get into chi-square test. And this is bad, right? This is, an, this is a suboptimal result because for once in our life, we do not want significance. Remember, significance means what in this context? We are worse than perfect. Now that seems like a really high bar, but that's what it is. We're worse than perfect. And here's the math by which that value was computed for you. Then we get into other fit indices. The general rule, if the fit index has the word error or residual in it, you want it to be small. If it has the word fit in it, you want it to be big. So RMSEA, 0.173, no one on earth would say that's good enough. 0.1 is like the most uh, lenient standard I've ever seen someone endorse. We have a confidence interval around that and we also have another p-value here. Cough, cough, homework question. This one has a special name. It is the test of close fit. Close fit instead of perfect fit. And so what it is close is operationalized by an RMSEA of 0.05 or less. So that's the benchmark that this p-value is testing against. And the fact that the confidence interval is way above 0.05 means, yeah, no, it's not less than 0.05. There's no way. So significantly worse than close. Not perfect, but close. Likewise, CFI 0.7. No one on earth would say that's good enough. That's relative to the worst model. So it's like we're only 73% away from the worst. You can kind of think of it that way. SRMR also relative to the best model. So this is one we want to be small. This one is the closest to being uh, reasonably good, but it's no, nowhere good enough, not good enough. Okay. In R, the same quantities are gonna be found in the last column. Your instructions asked you to use ma robust maximum likelihood. So that's the second column here. The first thing we get is the chi-square test of the model, HO versus H1, and the degrees of freedom and p-value for that. Then we get into the other test you can completely ignore because it's always null versus saturated, which doesn't help us, and other fit indices as well. So all the same information, just in a little bit different order. So any questions on global fit stuff or things you want to talk about, hit me. Why? Because, um, it's bad. It's 3. Yep. So CFI, the traditional cutoffs are 0.9 or 0.95. And this is way under. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's nowhere near. Like if this were 0.89 or something, I'd be like, okay, we're in the right direction. We just might need to tweak a few things. This is like a teardown. Like, no, this is bad. The best it can be is one. TLI goes above one, but it basically tells you the same information in an unstandardized way. Other questions? So this model is a little bit bad. Then we did some demonstration stuff, how to fit the saturated model, for instance. Saturated model lists all the item means, all the item variances, all the item covariances in the phrase. Same thing here in the same order with respect to the Levon code. We looked at those a while back. Then we get into the local fit. What's local fit as an idea? Yes, how far off each element is from what we observed in the data. So how wrong are you on each item mean? How wrong are you on each item variance? How wrong are you on each item covariance? 
which ones are wrong offer a clue as to how, how we should revise the model to make it fit better. And these are known as, res, like residual is the keyword that gets this in M plus. And it says things like residuals for correlations. Now this is a common point of confusion. Residuals for correlations is not the same thing as a residual correlation. Seriously, the four is really important. A residual correlation is specified in the model as a connection, double-headed arrow, between two errors, an error correlation. That's why I'm trying to stay away from the word residual in the model is to avoid this problem. What these are are discrepancies. This is what did the data say minus what the model predicted is the result. So residuals for correlations is the observed correlations minus the model predicted ones, and then this matrix shows you everything else. Um, note that there's zeros on the diagonal. That would be true even if we looked at discrepancies in the original covariance matrix. Why are all the diagonals zero? Because it should predict them perfectly. Right? Should predict oh, wait, what perfectly? No, we, we uh, no, these are discrepancies. Comparing the same thing. So this is the covariance matrix that is computed as the difference between data minus model prediction. So these are each how far off, how wrong we are with respect to each quantity. So the fact that these are zero means there is no discrepancy on the diagonal. So my question then is, what does that tell us? We got it right. We got it exactly right. Is that a coincidence or a consequence? Consequence. What specifically did we add to the model to make sure that these are all going to be right? Yes, unique variance, or error variance, or specific variance, just whatever's not the factor, that's what we can call it for sure. Likewise, this is the discrepancy in the means of the items, data minus model prediction. These are all zero. Coincidence or consequence? Consequence, and what did we put in the model to fix those? Intercepts. Each item gets its own intercept. That fixes the means to be correct. Each item gets its own error variance. That just plugs the hole to get to the total variance of whatever is not the factor. The off diagonals here. These are differences in covariance. So these are in different metrics, but it's the same information. These are differences in correlation. This is R output, this is M plus output. And then we get into the version that I mentioned in the slides, normalized residuals. These are like z-scores. So these are computed as the observed quantity for the covariance minus what the model predicted divided by the standard error of the observed quantity. So what happens is because standard errors are gonna be sample size dependent, they're gonna be smaller and larger samples, these numbers can get really, really large. So you want to look for relatively discrepant values. There's no like hard cutoff as to what it should be two or three or four. Just the ones that are the most problematic should catch your attention. So I put those in bold <laughs> in our case. So items one and two have a negative discrepancy, meaning they don't want to be together. The model thinks they're more related than they are. Or they're less related than we predicted, whichever way you want to say it. Positive ones means there's something else in common with these items that's not the factor. They are more correlated in the data than what we said. And I highlighted these ones in particular because they all go with the positively worded items. The model is not adequately creating the covariance between the positively worded items. It's doing a better job, relatively speaking, among the 
Negative ones, those are smaller because they have stronger loadings. So the model is really focusing more on describing the covariance among the negatively worded items at the expense of describing the covariance among the positively worded items accurately. So this kind of fine-tuned information gives us a lot of help in revising the model. So one strategy that I could do is to just slap a bunch of band-aids on this, and by band-aids I mean error covariances. Like I could put one here, and I could put one here, and I could put one here. Eh, that should make you a little bit uncomfortable. Like you already have one factor and you need that many band-aids? A principled solution would probably make more sense, and so that's where we're headed. Uh, the cheat codes, modification indices, help to prioritize these as well. So the information is roughly comparable, but not always. So for instance, two and four, it thinks is the biggest problem. If I added an error covariance between two and four, my chi-square for the difference between my model and the perfect model would get better by 161. So it was 300 and something. So it's like cut in half if I fix just this one spot and that error covariance would be fairly large. Uh, same thing with this one, that would be a very high error covariance too. The information out of R is not on the same scale. So these chi-squares are from the non-robust solution, not the robust solution. And to the best of my knowledge, I could not find a way to make it do that. So I had to rewrite homework questions to not ask for these values and instead ask for item number because they are internally consistent just with the wrong suggestion. So we can look at a two-factor model. And I think we started looking at this maybe last week. Does that sound right? So we're going to add a couple things here because I'll spoiler alert, this is the model we're going to use to interpret because it's going to fit well. And these are real data, by the way. I did not make this up. But I knew this was going to happen because it has happened in the other two subscales too. It's actually a six-factor scale, the way that it, it works. But we are also going to need to look at effect size and reliability out of this. And so to be able to do that, I'm adding some extra things to the code. So first, starting with M+. I have sit P and sit N. P stands for positive, N stands for negative. When you are naming your traits, you should pick something that is not sit. Otherwise, you will be confused when you look back at your code. So I'm having the positive items loading on one factor and the negative items loading on another. Each item has only one factor loading though. That is a choice. That is what's known as simple structure. And that is usually the most common approach, but not necessarily the best. In this context, I would hope that each item is measuring one trait. The things in parentheses here, these are either labels, constraints, or both. You can type whatever you want. What you are doing is attaching a name for each of the estimated parameters. Each label has to be eight characters or fewer, and it can't start with a number. But what I'm doing here is saying, hey, you know this, whatever this loading for item two is going to be, I want you to name that L1. And I want you to name this loading L2 and name this loading L3. L stands for loading. Do the same thing for the loadings in the negative factor as well, and I'm going to call them 4 through 6. So note, they don't have to correspond to the item numbers, right? I just started counting. This is the first loading. This is the second loading, even though loading 1 is for item 2. It doesn't care about that, and neither should you. For the sake of completeness, I labeled all of the parameters, even though we don't technically need that. Each item still has only one intercept. That will always be the case, no matter how many factors you have in your model and no matter how many loadings you have. Each item gets one intercept only. So I label those with an I. Likewise, each item gets one error variance only, no matter how many factors and no matter how many loadings, and I label those with an E. Then we have, for identification, standardized factors. So the variance of each factor is fixed to one. Every factor needs a scale. The mean of each factor is fixed to zero, so that's in the brackets, 
and I've added a factor covariance as a new parameter. So if we count up the parameters in this model relative to the previous one, we had 18. 6 times 3 is why we have 18. 6 items times 3 parameters apiece for one factor model. How many more have I added in fitting a second factor? We got one vote for three, one vote for one. People are counting in their heads. It is in this case just one. If it, we went from one factor to three, then it would be three. Because I have made the choice to not allow any what are called cross loadings, where an item has multiple loadings to different factors. So really what I'm asking in a model comparison of this two factor model against a one factor model is whether this covariance, which is in a correlation metric because the factors are standardized, whether this covariance is different than one. That's functionally, if this were one and my two factors were perfectly related, that's a one factor model. So we're testing whether we need to relax that correlation to be something lower than one instead. Down here, M plus will do math for you. Model constraint with the new statement is the analog to LINCOM in STATA, GLHT in R, estimate in SAS or test in SPSS. Did I forget any? Every package has something that you can do this with. This is how we do linear combinations of model parameters such as for computing reliability. So I am using the labels that I made up above to ask it to compute omega. Remember omega? Talked about it a little bit. Omega is the new alpha. It's reliability for a sum score, assuming unidimensionality. So that's why I have omega p and omega n, because it's per factor. But now I don't have to assume equal loadings. They're going to go in the formula. I don't have to assume no error covariances because if I had them, they go in the formula too. So the formula for omega, the one here, is where the factor variance would go. So I left that there as sort of as a point because if you have a model in which the factor variance is estimated, then that would need to go there. And then the sum of the loadings squared so note the parentheses, order of operations matters here, divided by the sum of the loadings squared plus the sum of the error variances. And so I did that for each. And don't forget to include any error covariances to C slide, what, 77? Cough, cough, homework question. Yes. Um, so you said that the one, the first set of one, Yes. Is the set also a yes. So like this term is repeated in the numerator and the denominator. Mm -hmm. So that's factor variance times the sum of the squared loadings. Nope. S -s nope. I said it the wrong way. The square of the sum of the loadings. Did I say it right then? This. <laughs> the sum of the loadings squared. That. Yes. I have an advice because yes. Hit me. In our homework, we have at the end something like the 21 items that we will need yes. to get Omega, and we know that the limit is 90 characters. So in that specific part, if you put all the loadings twice, that will exceed the limit. So what I did was created a previous thing, taking the sum of the loadings with that new object. I, I, I put that new thing in our formula, and that works. Okay, so I think what he's suggesting is to solve this in intermediate steps. So create a new thing that's just this much, create a new thing that's just this much, yes. and then add those things together. Exactly. Yes. So is this the same code? It would be like new mm -hmm. denominator. Yeah, exactly. It'd be like numerator, denominator. 
that like that. Um, you can also return. Uh, you can return to a new line and it will keep reading it. So if you go past 90, you can you don't have to worry about that because M plus does not stop based on the end of a line. Like in other packages, it stops based on the end of a semicolon. So it's going to keep keep reading until it hits that semicolon. You can't have more than 90 in a line. Um, here's another one that is, uh, this is something that folks get screwed up. So let's say that I have like 24 items or something that I'm writing out here. And at the end, I, so it takes more than one line to get them all. If you have long variable names, for instance, if you put the constraints at the end, they will only read on the same physical line of code. So you'd have to break it up to be like, these loadings, or, and then these labels, these loadings, these labels, these loadings, these labels, like that. It's stupid, but that's the rules. <laughs> it's not line specific until it is. Yes, that's correct. It, it, doesn't, it doesn't have an automatic line terminator as the end of a line, is what I was trying to say. Like in Stata, you don't have to like finish anything. You just run and it goes. In SAS, a line terminator is the semicolon. In SPSS, it's a period. So it just varies by language how that works. But you'll have to make sure that the labels are on the same physical line of code as the parameters that they apply to. OK, so this is how we compute omega. The nice part about doing it this way, besides just having it spit out for you, is that you will also get a standard error for your omega. So in your homework, I asked for the standard error. Um, oh, I got a question about this because I say lecture four, slide 77. This is what it was before. I decided to turn it into two different ones. So let me, 47, I was close then, right? Here it is. So yes, lecture 4B, slide 47 is the full formula, nope, come back, for omega. And this is the part that I don't have in my example because I don't have any error covariances, but you will in your homework. So don't forget to add twice the sum of all error covariances in your model to that, that are involved with that factor, I should say. I'm going to fix that right here and repost. Thank you. Okay. Questions on M plus syntax for this model. How about Levon? So the differences, everything is written in the same order so that you can draw a direct uh, comparison. The uh, hashtag here is comments in there. So equal squiggle is the analog to buy. That's how you tell it which items load on each factor. And the loadings are labeled with the front thing here next to the star. So L1 is a label for SIT2's loading. L2 is the label for SIT4's loading and so forth. Likewise, I have I1 for item 1's intercept, I2 for item whatever, 4's. Yeah, it doesn't, it's the first one. It doesn't actually need to match. I'm just doing it in order. Same thing with the error variances. I have E's in front of those to be their labels. And then I have fixed the variance of the factor to one. So one star means fixed at one in Levon. It does not mean free like it does in M plus. Sit P squiggle zero is how I tell it to fix the factor mean to zero. And then the covariance between the two I have labeled as fact cove times sit in here. So the label is this front part. And then the new thing that you have not yet seen is the analog to model constraint is colon equals. That means, hey, I'm making this new thing out of existing things. So omega p is computed in the same way, sum of the loading squared times the factor variance divided by that, plus the sum of the error variances and any co-variances as well. There. Who here loves to type? Anyone? Nope. 
So that's why I have two versions of this model. This super long one is very comprehensive and transparent. It lists everything that's being estimated and everything that's not being estimated. It takes a lot of work. If you write absolutely everything, you would use the function built in called Levon. If you're like, yeah, that's too much damn typing, can I make this easier? Then you can do a short version like this, where all you have to specify is the factor part and everything else is estimated by default. And if you do it this way, you need to use the function SEM instead. They are not interchangeable. Within the Levon package, there's different functions that have built in defaults for different kinds of models. So they're trying to make it easier to have less typing, but then it's less obvious what's actually happening in your model. So if you do the short version, make sure you change the name to SEM rather than Levon. Okay. Other things that I'm going to do in R that I'm not doing in M plus because I can't. I am going to do my likelihood ratio test. So we have model one, which was the single factor model. I'm comparing it to model four, which is the two factor model. This will not be done for you in any package. You have to do it. You have to ask for it yourself. The only likelihood ratio test comparisons that are done for you are against the saturated H1. What this is doing is taking the HO model from before and comparing it to my current HO model. And then getting all of the other uh, pieces of information with which to judge its fit. So questions or comments on that? Any of you want to hear again? Vladimir. I have one. In the another part, mm -hmm. is that considering the, the scaling factor? It is. Yep. I will show what that looks like in just a second. So this is doing the correct version of the likelihood ratio test for robust maximum likelihood that incorporates the scaling factors. Want to see it? Why not, right? So sure enough, 19 parameters. Based on this much, my new chi-score test for the model against my perfect model is down to 24. It was like 300 before, so that's a good sign. Here is here are the computations by which to do the, the rescaled likelihood test. So I wrote that all out so that you could see the logic, but I also have it down here in the Excel spreadsheet that I built. So this is in um, example four. It's on the website next to the download packets for everything. So note the instructions here, fill in <laughs> and calculate it. Also note here, the model that has fewer parameters needs to be first and the model that has more needs to be second. Otherwise, it will be uh, backwards. So if I use the values entered, um, that M plus reported to all the values given, which is what I'm telling folks to do, I get a test statistic scale difference in chi-square right here of 341.953. That's my test statistic telling me that my two-factor model fits significantly better than my one-factor model. In R, it's 342.289. So very, very close, but it would not be uh, correct to the second decimal place. So in your homework, we, I, we made sure to check that it, two decimal places is it matches to this time. But this does get a little bit off because of differences in precision across the two. What do we think about the fit of the model? RMSEA, thumbs up or thumbs down? It's 0.044. What do we want it to be? Big or little? Little. Less than 0.05, ideally. Less than 0.08, for sure, is the conventional standards. This one, yeah. The confidence interval includes 0.05. And this p-value says that we have not rejected the test of close fit. Do not, yeah, I, I hate saying it that way. It fits closely. How's that? <laughs> Is that like accepting the null? I don't know. It fits closely. C. How about CFI? Is 0.985. What do we think of that? It's pretty, pretty good. Damn near perfect. Yep. Oh, but this one, chi-square test of model fit for the baseline model, that one's still significant. Do I care? 
No, this is null versus saturated. It has nothing to do with what you're doing. It should be significant. Yeah, it's null versus saturated. So it's literally testing if you have any covariance in your data set. That's what it's telling you. And if the answer is no, like if this is ever non-significant, you're done. Just nope, just take your ball and go home. Last but not least, SRMR. Do we want that one to be big or little? Little, because it has the word residual in it. Yeah, this one's 0.03. This is how far off our predicted correlations are on average from the ones in the data. That's right. 0.08-ish, I think, is the, the standard traditionally. This one is well, well within that. So things are looking pretty good. Let's look at the actual solution. So we have our unstandardized loadings here. All of them are significant. These are in the original scale, so we don't yet have a sense of their effect size. Here's the most interesting part, and that's why it's in bold. SIT P with SIT N, that's my factor covariance. If a one factor model were adequate, that would be one. Because my factors have a mean of zero and a variance of one, that covariance is actually a correlation. So that's another reason why standardized factors are convenient because then you can look at covariances directly as correlations in the structural model. So the answer, these two factors are only correlated 0.56. Considering they're all supposed to be measuring forgiveness of situations, that's pretty low, right? 0.56 squared, like what, 30% of the variance in common, something like that? That's not, that's not very high. So yeah, it matters if you ask people if they're forgiving or if they're not unforgiving. You know what happens in life when people give this measure? Add them up, 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 add them up, 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 into one thing, call it a score. Yep, unfortunately. They, that, like, they're always separate. Like, it always factors out with the wording in, in this particular, in every data set I've seen with this measure. So, I, the, the, the resolution to that discrepancy is coming in unit eight when I'm gonna show you what the structural model looks like for this scale. It, it's a beast. It's one of the cooler ones I've ever come up with, I gotta tell you. I found a way to sort of put it all back together again so that we could get what, what the authors originally intended. Uh, let's see, we got factor means, item intercepts, factor variances, residual variances. This is the amount of variance in each item due to not the factor and our new additional parameters, okay, our new omegas. 0.74 for omega P for the positive items and a little bit higher at 0.78 for omega N. And here's the standard errors that go with them. Those will be a function of sample size, more people, smaller standard errors. Here's the math for how we got those numbers here. And here's the standardized results. So now that we have everything on one page here, can anyone tell me why they think omega n has better reliability in comparing to omega p? The answer is on the page, that's all I'll say. Why is reliability greater, relatively speaking? for omega n than omega p. Um, I'm, I would say that's probably unrelated. What goes into omega? What's it built from? Loadings and errors. Mm -hmm. So we got standardized loadings here. Which factor is better measured? The N one. Yeah, the, the loadings are higher. More of these items are attributable to the factor for the negative ones than the positive ones. So these are considered effect size. The fact that they're all well above, you know, point, like I'd say 
0.3 or 0.4 is about the lowest you'd want to see on these. These are pretty decent. Yeah, I can live with this. It's fine. Here's the same information in R square form because R squared is R squared. Here's the same output in Levon, and note that it adds the labels in the output. I love that. That's very helpful. Like, because once you get into these really like complex models, trying to find exactly what number you need can be very tricky. So the only catch is that it truncates these labels if you make them long. So just make them short. So in Levon output, the unstandardized solution is first, and then the standardized solution is the last column. So anything that's referring to standardized goes comes out of here. Otherwise, everything agrees. Uh, with respect to the intercepts and variances, the dot indicates that it is an intercept that's conditional because this is an outcome, whereas not a dot means the, it's a mean instead. It's unconditional because it's a predictor. Likewise, the dots in front of the variances here, those are indicating error variances specifically, and then these are variances instead, unconditional. And here's my new omega. So are we done? Do I win? I got a good fitting model? Not quite. I want to make sure that I haven't overlooked anything, right? Because you can still have little pockets of problems that wash out if the rest of it looks good. So we're going to go back to the local fit and see how bad things are. So the worst correlation discrepancy is between 5 and 6. It's almost 0.1. That's the highest one. I can live with that. The normalized residuals change those discrepancies into something like a z-score. We've got two that are relatively um, uh, large. One and two still want to be less together than they already are. They're already on different factors. I don't know how to fix that. And five and six want to be more together. They're on different factors. The, uh, now we have a new type of modification index. These by statements, as they're called, these are what are known as cross loadings. So this suggestion, like the 10 here, it says, if I let positively worded situation item six load on the negative factor in addition to loading on its positive factor that it already does, my chi-square would further decrease by about 10. Now, does this make any kind of sense if I'm defining one as positively worded and negatively worded? Nope. That breaks, that breaks it. So no, we're not going to do that. Alternatively, two and four want to be, where is it? Yeah, so two and four, where is it? This one. This one's not even one of the stronger ones, but for whatever reason, it's focusing on that. So each of these is, is like plugging a hole, but if you do that, the rest of the model will shift around it. So if you're looking at these suggestions, you would want to do one by one. It wants me to add an error correlation between two and four. I don't have any reason to do that. Like there's nothing about those items that would merit that. Same thing with four and six. So as I'm gonna say, I have no theoretically defendable reason to add these terms, we're done. It's good enough. Is it perfect? No, but it's close. Close enough is a technical term in these models. Okay, how are we doing? So let's look a little bit about what this solution implies. The factor scores I asked for. So we have reliability of 0.74 and 0.78. Is that good enough? In some fields, that'd be fine. For only three items, that's not super terrible. But let's think about what that actually implies in terms of precision of measurement. Would you want to have a life-altering test score like passing the bar exam or getting into graduate school that had a reliability of 0.74? Probably not. So let's turn this into an examination of what is the standard error of measurement that this amount of reliability implies? The same type of process we would go through in classical test theory, but from a, a measure of reliability that understands the model. So I'm going to ask for factor scores. Here is the function in Levon that does it. Um, Jonathan wrote his own function with matrices and stuff. When it, it, so if you want to see what that looks like, there's a link to that. 
Because, you know, that's what you do when things aren't in the package. You just write your own function and, you know, solve. Just a little real analysis. In M+, plus, it is this line right here. You, if you turn that on, you will get factor scores saved to a data set with this name. What these are are EAP estimates. They are the most likely factor score for each person given the model. I printed them out so that we could do some description stuff with it. So this is M plus output regarding the estimated factor scores. SIT PSE, that means the standard error of the factor scores. It is one number. This model assumes that reliability holds equally for everyone because each item has a linear slope and the linear slope keeps going. So there's no point at which the slope would like shut off or slow down. That comes next week because we're assuming continuous outcomes. So the standard error is 0.47 for the positive one and 0.42 for the negative one. So traditionally, if we were to build a confidence interval around your score, right, two standard errors around your score, that works out to plus or minus 0.94. What's the standard deviation in this metric? Factors were set to have what kind of scale in our model? Uh, say it again? No, the, the factor. Like, like when we identified the model, we gave the factor a mean and a variance. What were they? Zero, mean, of, mean of zero, variance of one. Yeah, easy to get those switched, but if you try to give it a variance of zero, it'll blow up. So order matters. So you're telling me that my score is somewhere within uh, two standard deviations. Like the range, like each person's score is somewhere between essentially a standard deviation of like negative one, which is zero to one. That's what this range is. Is that useful? Is that sufficiently precise? It's like you're somewhere on the real number line. Good luck. Yeah, no, this is not good. If a test can only tell you if you're within two standard deviations, that's not good enough. So these levels of reliability, I think it's easy to say, well, 0.7 is not so bad. But when you look at it this way, it's like, yeah, no, three items is not enough. So we have good fit, or good enough fit at least, but we have not measured these traits very well. Here is a distribution of the factor scores. Anything that draw your attention to this distribution? Yeah, what happened? What happened is my question. These are people who forgave everything. They answered seven to all three items. We don't know how forgiving they are because we're out of room. They're at the ceiling. So even though factor scores are supposed to be normally distributed as assumed by the model, that is not going to be the case in real world data sets that have very few items. Same thing on the negative one. So it's much more a problem of ceiling effects and not so much floor effects because the lower end doesn't seem to have this issue. Why would we not work with factor scores? Why would we stay in latent space if we can? Here's a couple other things to point to that. These values right here, these are the variances of the outputted factor scores. Situation P has a variance of its factor score of 0.78. Situation N has a variance of 0.83. What are they supposed to be? What do we tell them to be in the model? One, they're much smaller. There's a term for this. It's called shrinkage. Uh, shrunken estimates is another term that's related to that. Essentially, what happens is that because there's not much reliability, extreme scores get pushed to look more like the middle. So anyone who didn't answer all three items or anyone who was at sort of the, the edges, like they get pushed. 
So these factor scores do not have the same properties as what they would in the model. They have less variability, and the covariability is different too. If we compute factor score reliability as another measure of reliability, omega is for sum scores. If you are going to add these items up, omega tells you the reliability of that sum score according to this model. Factor score reliability uses the variance of the factor score and the standard error of the factor score squared. And so that one is a little bit higher. So the, the reliability of these factor scores is 0.82 and 0.85. Now, what about this continuous deal? In the Excel spreadsheet that goes with this example, I've made some pictures. These are regression lines. This is y equals mx plus b, as you learned it in eighth grade, or y equals item intercept plus factor loading times factor. And I developed predicted outcomes for factor values ranging from plus or minus three standard deviations. And these are the lines for each item. So the intercept for each item should be the value exactly at the factor score of zero. And the slope is the factor loading in the unstandardized solution. So then the question is, where do these predictions go out of bounds? This scale goes from one to seven. And after about two standard deviations, they run out of room. So somebody who is super forgiving, according to this model, would answer eight, but they can't. So in thinking about whether your item response distributions are normal enough to be able to use CFA, it's not just the shape, it's whether a linear model is a good fit to these data, whether it makes sense conceptually. They don't go out of bounds on the lower side for the positive factor, but they start to for the negative factor. So this would make me a little bit uncomfortable if at least most of your range of distribution doesn't is, it needs to, most of, the, most of your factor distribution needs to be within the bounds of the scale. If it goes out, that's a problem. Can you guess how we're gonna fix it? Logits, 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 logits. See, this is the crossover to the next class. We're doing uh, proportional odds models today, one of my least favorite things to talk about ever. But that type of model is how we're gonna fit um, ordinal factor models. They're proportional odds models, cumulative logits. What if we had just taken the mean? How comparable are the factor scores to just the mean across items? Pretty damn comparable is the answer. Correlated 0.98, correlated 0.97. This is why people do factor analysis and then just add shit up. Because if your model actually fits well and the items are relatively homogeneous in terms of how well they work with the factor, you come to about the same conclusion with the simpler thing. However, you might come to a different conclusion with how these things relate to each other. So the factor scores have a correlation of 0.67 whereas the item means only have a correlation of 0.45. So it does change, it can change the story. All right, so pictures, questions. Last thing then, very last thing, testing classical test theory assumptions. In that unit, I kept saying, this is testable, this is testable, right? Like whether items are equally discriminating is testable. We're gonna do that now. So I'm going to fit an alternative model to see if I have evidence for my items being exchangeable in terms of their discrimination, equally discriminating, how equivalent or true score equivalent. All of those terms mean the same thing. I'm gonna start with one factor at a time, and I pick the negative one first. So this is an example. I'll highlight it in R and in M plus at the same time. There we go. This is an example of how a label is also a constraint. So I have one word in parentheses, neg load, and I have the same word in three spots down in the R code. 
what that is doing is say, hey, can you make the loading the same for all three of these things? Like, still go find it, but make it the same. So how many parameters have I saved if I do this? Not quite. Yeah, it's just two because I still have to do one loading, but I don't have to do three of them. So this is an example of when a hypothesis test would be answering the question, worse or not worse, because you're taking parameters away, you're simplifying. Survey says, so note, this is Levon output for brevity's sake. The unstandardized loadings are all 1.254, so it did what I wanted. Note the standardized loadings still differ. That's because the error variances still differ. So we're just focusing on the unstandardized loadings and asking the question, is 1.254 good enough for all three of these? So here's a comparison of the fit relative to the original two-factor model and the new version, where we took two parameters away. What do you think about the fit of the new version? RMSEA was 0.044, now it's 06. A little worse. Yeah, a little worse. 0.98, CFI is down to 0.96. A little worse. Yeah, it's, it's still not terrible. Yeah, it's still up there. But we can do a likelihood ratio test to compare. And the chi-square for that on two degrees of freedom is 34, with key zero to several decimal places. So it is worse. The power for this test is going to depend on your sample size, though. So we may be slightly overpowered to detect this difference. But what the significant results tell, tells me is that these items don't want to have the same loading. These items are not equally discriminating in measuring negative forgiveness. Say it again. What would it look like if it worked? Let's do the other factor. <laughs> so let's try it on the positive one again. And it's going to work. And so what I went ahead and did is computed alpha because alpha assumes equal discrimination. So if you fit a model with equal discrimination and compute the regular formula for omega, it simplifies to alpha because you have one loading three times. So this is a formal test as to whether alpha is a better measure of some score reliability or is an adequate measure or whether omega is better. So now the, com the combined loading here is 1.0. Note what's going on in the other factor. One and three look pretty similar, but it's item five that's different than the two. Likelihood ratio test, survey says, chi-square of 2.6 on two degrees of freedom, non-significant. So yeah, they're happy. They're happy sharing. 1.01, .01. previously when we looked at the solution, they were 1.0, 1.0, and 0.96. So they were closer. So now we can do one last comparison. Next layer of constraint, parallel items. Parallel items means the items not only are equally discriminating, but they also have the same amount of error variance. Right, Erica? She's giving a talk in like two weeks about all about this, right? Yep. So here's where I'm doing the same trick. Oh, can I do it on one screen? Not quite. So I've got pause load still. We're still keeping the loadings constrained. And I'm adding pause error at the end of that. So one error variance instead of three. How many parameters did I save? Two. Yep. And this, by the way, 
is Spearman Brown reliability. So which reliability coefficient is most appropriate is an answerable question via model comparisons. That's where we're going with this. And if the assumptions don't hold, the reliability coefficient is not valid. Survey says, that's a game show reference from the 80s, by the way. It's Family Feud, I believe. Yeah, the, the host used to say, survey says, and point to the board and the answer would show up. So I once had a student tell me in evaluations that the whole semester they were confused because they thought I was referring to some survey that they didn't know what they were talking about. I'm like, oh, OK, I need to explain this joke. There's no survey. It's, it's just a pop culture reference from the 80s because that's, that's my savant category. But want, want, it's significant. What's that mean? Significantly better or significantly worse? It depends on how you're approaching it. If I approach it with, I had a model in which the error variances were all different, and then I made it the same by simplifying, if I talk about it that way, I've made my model what by simplifying? Significantly worse. Yep. If you want to say it the other way, allowing the error variances to differ is significantly better. You can say it either way. But knowing which way you're headed is an interpretation thing. So yes, we don't have evidence that the error variances can be constrained, so we don't have evidence for parallel items. And for those of you who are new to me, this is what I do with all my examples, words. The entire handout, this is what it would look like in a results section. When you do homework three, you may borrow my words. I'm giving you permission. However, you better hit find and replace for situation forgiveness, because if I read situation forgiveness in your reports, I am not going to be happy. <laughs> it happens at least once a semester. <laughs> So please just do that much, okay? Uh, there's more words here than what I would typically write. I, I went long to try and be explan ex explanatory. But I have an intro paragraph here that describes sort of my process, how I'm, how I'm inde indexing fit, what software I used, how I identified my factors, all that kind of stuff. And then I have separate paragraphs for what happens in terms of each of the models. And then I have references in here to what the tables would be that you would report that correspond to worksheets in the Excel that I gave with this. Um, if you want to make pictures in Excel, that's fine. If you want to use a software package to make your pictures, I don't care. But I will ask for this type of factor model predictions in homework three, which is a picture that looks like, scroll, 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 almost there. Picture that looks like this, these ones. Because the objective is most of you have ordinal data, some of you have binary data even to analyze. I want you to see how the results turn out differently if you assume they're continuous and normally distributed. Where do the predictions go out of bounds? And then when you fit the writer model, the ordinal model or the binary model, how different are your conclusions? That's what I want you to, to see. Oh, <laughs> I touched the stupid thing and now the screen's going. Okay, there we go. I got to get myself a new connector, do some Amazon shopping after class. There, we made it. We, re we really truly did because there's only like one side left and it had what we just did, testing assumptions. So the big picture wrapping up in the minute we have left here, CFA is a linear regression model in which you're predicting multivariate item responses from a latent variable that's your factor. So all the things you learned about linear regression, not working for other kinds of outcomes, still holds. So the difference relative to adding stuff up is that we are explicitly giving items characteristics here by which they can differ, their difficulty, their discrimination. Factor score is not just the same as the sum of the items. We can decide how many factors we want. 
whether each item loads on which factor, whether we need any additional sources of relationship. So we can do all of these things. To make our test better, we need not just more items, but more better items, right? If we were going to simplify, like if I have a huge set of items, you would look for the ones that are most discriminating. But that assumes that all items remain equally discriminating no matter where you are on the factor distribution. The slope keeps going forever and ever. So when we change the slope to make it stay within the boundaries, like the low GD curve, this thing, that has consequences for reliability. It's now going to be factor level specific because you have to know how many items still are going at that point on the factor. So that's the big difference in terms of how we think about what is a good item in IRT land starting next week. It's not just which is good, but good for whom. Where is it good? That's what's coming up. Ta-da! We really finished it. Hooray! Unit 4 is over. And you can finish everything in your homework. Yay. Any questions as we wrap things up here? Zoomers, you've been quiet today. Rumors, Vladimir. I have a quick one. Okay. How can we estimate factor covariance when we have both variances set to one? Because you can still ask what the relationship between them is. That, like that, that is irrespective. The covariance is always identified. You don't have to do anything separately to identify that, because once we have a scale for the variance, we can always find the covariance. Mean, oh, mean and variance, I should say. But yeah. Anything else? All right, it's Thursday. Have good weekends. Let me know if you need anything. And have fun with the homework. Yay. It's not due Monday. I gave you a head start, so you've got a whole nother week to work on it. All righty then. Yay.